Excerpt from the Diary of the Honourable Lady Mahon, compiled in 1956, when she was 78. In July 1884, John Ross Mahon died. He had lived at Weston. He was the brother of Sir William Mahon and had succeeded his cousin, Charles Philgate, as agent of the Castle Guard Clumbrock Properties. He, like his cousins, had always been an intimate friend of the family. They were all very sad at losing him. In November 1887, my father took Rockfield, Ballybrack, for six months. We were all there till May 1888 with a three-week interval at Clumbrock for Christmas and shooting. Uncle Bob, Aunt Harry, Hilda and Charlie were also at Clumbrock, as they were always there at the same time of the year. Stella was not born until the following Christmas. Being at Ballybrack was convenient for everybody. My father could easily attend numerous landlords and church meetings in Dublin. Mother, of course, enjoyed having a house of her own, and near her brother Francis Crofton, who was harbour master at Kingston and lived at Harbour House. She also could be continually in Dublin on business connected with the Irish Distressed Ladies Society, which, if not actually started then by Mrs. Power Laidler, was certainly in its infancy. They both, with Miss Blanche Butler and Miss Rose Thunder, worked hard at the Society's headquarters in Rutland Square. Being a Ballybrack was useful too, for Georgie, as a masseuse, could easily be got over from London to live at Rockfield and give her treatment. A daily governess could also be got for us. I don't know what we that we cared so much for that, but we certainly enjoyed our winter at Ballybrack. At breakfast there, one morning in the early spring of 1888, my father, opening his letters, exclaimed in horror, his lordship's sight has failed. He went down to Clumbrock by the first possible train. Dr. Swansea, the best-known Dublin archaeologist, went down too, but nothing could be done. Grandpapa had been sitting reading in the drawing room after dinner when he suddenly said, The lamp has gone out. It will be remembered that he had only one eye since his shooting accident when he was a young man. Now a clot of blood had practically taken the sight from the other eye. I had remembered him as a quiet blind after that, but he must have been able to see a little, as a year later when he was recovering from a very bad attack of bronchitis, Mother's diary for April the 11th, 1889, says that he was very low about his sight, which is, appear, appears to be at last failing. He could still then go about out of doors, as a photograph taken in May 27th, 1889, on the black back lawn shows. He also still went to church. He had always liked singing. Now that he could no longer read the words in the hymn book, he had the hymns for the following Sunday read to him a few times during the week. Having a wonderful memory, he could just thus join in perfectly in church. A few months later, in September, he took a house, Belmore, on the sea road at Galway for a few weeks. He, my parents, Georgia and her aunts Helen and Kate, Katie were there. That was the last time he ever slept away from home. He was now 82, and being a tall, big, heavy man, he never had the strength to walk more than a few steps with help after a very bad illness that he had immediately on his return from Galway. He had a terrible... Um, abscess on the back of his neck and blood poisoning from, from it. It seemed impossible that he could recover. All that winter, 1889, and during the next spring, he was in bed in the blue room. In May 1890, he was wheeled into the canopy room 
the room next to mother's. And that now became his sitting room. On fine days, he was carried downstairs and went out in a bath chair drawn by a jennet or for a drive in the Victoria. On September the 9th, 1890, my brother Robin's coming of age was celebrated. It was fortunately a lovely day and Grandpapa was able to be wheeled out onto the steps in the morning. There was a large gathering in the front of the house when two of the chief tenants presented Robin with the illuminated address now hanging on the front stairs of Glenbrock. After he had thanked them, Grandpapa, sitting in his chair, made a speech. Mother's diary said, Everything most successful. Great good feelings about... Lord Crofton's speech, most touching and well-spoken. Grandpapa was not able to go to the large luncheon to the tenants, but it was a happy day for him. He was very thankful to have lived to see it, and very much gratified at all the tributes that had been paid to him. Aunt Helen and Mother were the two responsible, responsible for Grandpapa's health though he had trained nurses as well. They, from now on, never both left home at the same time. I can still hear Aunt Helen's anxious voice when she often came into Mother's room saying, Do you think it's warm enough for his lordship to go out today? Grandpapa's mind was perfectly clear, really up to the day before he died. He still took a great interest in everything that was going on at the home, and in public events. Now he could no longer read. His family took turns to read to him the whole day long. My father went up to his room soon after breakfast, having seen to the stewards downstairs. They then, then discussed farm matters, etc., and the news in the day's paper. After that, the aunts, mother and Georgie, succeeded one after another and read to him an hour each at time all day. Sometimes Uncle Ned appeared unexpect unexpectedly from Moat. He then amused Grandpapa for hours at a time, talking and reading to him. Uncle Ned was once asked to do a very difficult thing in connection with him. Grandpapa had for many years been Lieutenant of the County. When he got old and ill, his family began to feel, I don't remember in which year, that he ought to resign, but how to suggest that to him. Uncle Ned undertook the delicate job and did it most cleverly and tactfully. Grandpapa was only horrified at not having thought of it himself and did not know how to send in a resignation quick enough. My father was appointed HML in succession to him which was said to be a great compliment, as it was most unusual for a son to be appointed after a father. Grandpapa liked some prayers read to him in the morning and at night. Mother went to him always at night, read the prayers, and as he could never sleep in the early part of the night, stayed talking to, to him, sometimes up to 1 p.m. at 1 a.m. During these intimate talks, during which she had learned much from the wisdom he had accumulated during his long life. She got to know and love him as never before. On May the 2nd, 1892, Aunt Georgie died. So the aunts from now onward were reduced, were reduced to four. In November, 1893, there was a bad epidemic of flu in Clembrock. At least six people had it at the same time, and then Grandpapa got it. Wonderful though his vitality had been through the illness he had in the last few years, this time it failed, and on December the 3rd, 1893, he died peacefully at the age of 86. Mother's diary says, Our dear old man is gone. The funeral was on December the 9th. On that day, she says, in the early morning, the coffin was brought into the hall. Ned, Charlie, Arthur, Crofton and Johnny Torbert 
came about 12. At 1.15 all started for a house the whole country present, 137 carriages, etc. Mr. St. George returned and the will was read. We knew all about it.